great to still see so many people here. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to try and cover in this hour something that has been a recurring theme that I've heard throughout all of the two days, almost every single session, is all of this value is being captured in our land. Uh, we saw graphs from Beth and from others showing the huge increase in land values. Um, but it's just not accruing to us as a general population. It's accruing to that subset of us, of people, uh, who own the land. Um, and so this session is going to explore a, a variety of different ways in which we might try and recapture some of that value for us. So not letting it just disappear off into private hands. Um, and it's a, you know, this, this idea of capturing the value. So first of all, you know, for me, the most important thing is that who, who's generating this value? Who makes a piece of land uh, valuable? Well, in general, it's not, <laughs> it's not the individual. It's us. It's us as communities, as people. Uh, we're generating the value that, that, that goes into that land. And so uh, that means we should also have some kind of right to, the, the, to, to that value. Um, I think what's also interesting about this area is it's an area that has an extraordinary consensus around it. Uh, uh, from you know, my discipline as an, as an economist, but also outside, um, there's extraordinarily a, a, an amount of consensus that people do have a right to get this. And uh, everything from land value tax to, to planning taxes and others uh, have all been advocated by a wide spectrum of economists from a wide different uh, series of backgrounds. And this, um, this wealth concentration driven by private people uh, retaining more and more of the value of the land really is a problem for our economy. It's driving the seriously high levels of wealth inequality in the country. Um, it's underpinning a bloated and unstable financial system which is, again, I think a theme that we've heard through this. This land economy is actually sustaining a financial system that's also causing a, you know, a lot of damage on its own, but is also hampering our ability to uh, tackle land properly. Um, and it's also promoting a hugely inefficient use of uh, a lot of our public resources. We've heard a lot about how much land ownership is subsidized. Uh, all of this money is going into maintaining the system of ownership, uh, maintaining the value of land, uh, and it's then disappearing off into uh, people's pockets. Um, so the economic phenomenon that this is describing is what's called economic rent. And economic rent is often a bit of a confusing concept. People tend to confuse it with rent. You know, if I just go and rent my house, uh, you pay a kind of charge. But I think I'll just give a quick definition of economic rent to help you know, clarify some of that. Um, so it's one from Joseph Stiglitz. So it means getting an income not as a reward for creating wealth, but by grabbing a larger share of wealth that would have been produced anyway. And it's this idea that just by collecting all this land together, you get wealth without actually doing anything. So we're now going to look at, uh, so the three of us will talk for 10 minutes or so, uh, hopefully open up for lots of questions. It's always the questions I always find are the most interesting part of the talk. Um, so. Many of you will know Molly, uh, amazing uh, economist first, now Green MEP, um, uh, representing the southeast and also Gibraltar. I was southwest, yeah. Southwest, sorry, and, uh, and Gibraltar. Um, and she, Molly's going to talk a little bit about uh, land value tax. Thank you very much. So I start thinking about this from the perspective of an economist and hey, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and from the understanding that the greatest source of wealth is in our land. And it's the most enduring source of wealth in any human community as well. I mean, we can grow food there, particularly at the, mo at the moment we can see that land can be used as a form of capturing carbon, which is crucial to solving climate change. It's also needed to build our homes, for our parks, for leisure and recreation. So it's the most valuable commodity, I believe, in any economy. And for that reason, or relatedly, the monopoly of land ownership is the greatest 
source of injustice in our community. And yet it is very rarely talked about. A lot of the assumptions around land ownership and the need for many, many people to pay rent to have their share of a piece of land, whereas others have acquired that land for whatever reason historically and can now live from the proceeds. That is very rarely challenged, and I think that is a, a crucial political change we need to make. And I think that part of the, the role of the Green Party in politics is to represent this particular interest in our political system. So if economists conventionally say that there are three factors of production, capital, labour and land, or probably the other way around, so capital, I would say, is defended by the Tories. Labour, unsurprisingly, defended by Labour. And I think there's a historic role there for Greens in representing the land in a political sphere. And actually, if you look back at um, political history and the 1930s, which I'm afraid we have some very uncomfortable echoes of what's going on in our political system today, the countries that avoided fascism most effectively were those that had strong peasant or land-based political parties. And so I think that the political commitment to land is going to be very important in maintaining our, our democratic system. I also think that the ownership of land is kind of spiritually offensive. I mean, I understand that you had a storyteller at the beginning who ended up saying that we belong to the land, the land doesn't belong to us. And I remember when I first heard an indigenous person say that, it kind of completely blew me away and kept coming back to me and really changed the way I saw the world and all sorts of economic questions around wealth and um, yeah, uh, success really, economic success. So I think it's a very important, almost a spiritual commitment to say that owning land, thinking that you can own something as precious as land is in itself a mistake. And we should think about it much more in terms of stewardship. Um, and then lastly, just while I'm still on my political bit at the beginning, um, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, the previous session was about Brexit and how we'll be coming out of the common agricultural system. And it is to me quite extraordinary that what the common agricultural system means is that we are paying money and the larger the land ownings, land holdings of the person, the more money we pay to them. Now how on earth people could have arranged a system like that is quite extraordinary because as I'm going to explain, I think we should be taxing people for the privilege of owning land rather than rewarding them for that privilege. And actually I was sitting in the committee, I'm on the Agriculture Committee in the European Parliament, I was sitting on that committee one day reading something from George Monbiot who obviously started on this jag before he got angry about a whole load of other things, quite justifiably. <laughs> and, um, he, I was just reading something he'd said about how, you know, it was all about uh, hereditary landowners and so on. And then the person who was chairing the meeting spoke, and he was actually a count, somebody from something or other in Germany, you know. And I thought, yeah, George is completely right. I'm sitting in the committee that proves that. And, of course, those are the people that decide how the common agricultural policy is currently distributed. Right, so, um, land value tax. It's always been a Green Party policy since the party was founded, but it's not only the Green Party. As you were saying, you know, there's been support for it actually fairly widely, and it was a Liberal Party policy for some of the 20th century anyway, and the old sort of Liberals, who I think still exist, still support this policy. And this year I was invited to the Liberal Democrat Conference to talk about it, so they're re-exploring their philosophical basis, and this is one of the issues they're considering. So I think it's... You know, it, it may be coming back into fashion, and I, I really hope so. Um, so Greens support land value tax on the basis of understanding land as a common treasury. And therefore, if you are particularly fortunate to, to own land, you should pay the community for the privilege of that. It's also, obviously, a very efficient tax. I work a lot, I mean, I'm on the Agriculture Committee, I'm also on the Finance and Monetary Policy Committee, and I'm also on the tax, Special Tax Committee, which is looking into the Panama Papers and how <coughs> wealthy people and large corporations avoid paying their tax. And how they do that is by moving their profits around. Now, the nice thing about land is that you can't do that with it. So you know where it is, you know who, who's got it, if you organise a proper survey, which obviously for political reasons we haven't done since for a while, since 1089, I think. Um, but anyway, you know, assuming you have the right information, people can't escape paying their land tax. You can't offshore it. So um, I think that's you know, two strong reasons why a land value tax would be an efficient way of bringing revenue in. So um, Kate Barker, in her recent book, Housing, Where's the Plan?, gave two examples of land gaining value as a result of planning permission. And I know that Duncan's going to talk about this more, but I think it's important to realise that 
changing the status of land can massively change its value, and that increase in value should be captured for the Commonwealth rather than accruing to a small number of people who are fortunate enough to gain planning permission. So the examples she gave were in Cambridge, where agricultural land with no planning permission was worth about 18,500 a hectare in 2010, whereas residential land was worth 2.9 million. And in Belfast, agricultural land was assessed at an average value of £24,000 a hectare, compared with a residential value of £1.25 million. And you can see there that, in fact, social and economic changes that we bring about in the quality of that land can massively increase its value. And I'll leave Duncan to explain more about why that's iniquitous and how we can bring the value of that back for the common good. But I think also we need to ask these questions about the wider value of land. Whose land is it? What is it for? And although people don't understand necessarily the idea of economic rent, I think the idea of a rentier is, is quite um, a strong one. And it basically means parasite, doesn't it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> My economic definition is a bit wrong there. No, you know, it means somebody that lives from other people's work or from something they haven't created the value for themselves. And that's, that's how land operates, and that's how land maintains... Um, powerful elites over extremely long time periods and that's why that's the problem with introducing this land value tax it's a rational system it's a fairly practical system it's a system that when you can explain it to people it makes a lot of sense to them the problems are political it's about vested interests it's about old you know ancien riche and nouveau riche who like the idea of accumulating wealth and then investing that in land and then it being secure and untouchable and that's what we have to change. So um, I also wanted to briefly touch on, I know this was the previous session, but what are we going to do after we come out of, assuming we leave the European Union, we will no longer be part of the common agricultural policy. It's one of the things we know for certain, whether we take the, what was it somebody said this morning, the full English Brexit model <laughs> or the, the continental Brexit model. We will, we, either way, we will still have to set up a new farm subsidy system. So... One of the things that we make, must make absolutely clear is that we will no longer follow this principle where the richer you are, the more money you get. I mean, it's an absurd <laughs> principle, but in, in land ownership terms, in cap terms, that's what happens. The larger landowners receive more money. Incidentally, I should say explicitly that I exclude um, bodies from that. I'm talking about individuals and families. So the National Trust, for example, is a recipient of a large amount of farm support and the Wildlife Trust as well. And I think because they're organisations owned in common, that, that's perfectly legitimate. I'm talking about things like in 2012, when 889 landowners received more than £250,000, and of those, 133 were given more than 500000 and 47 were given more than a million pounds in subsidy. I mean, it's just you know beyond the wildest dreams of anybody who works in a, an industry that's facing difficulties and might be calling out for some government help. That's, that's not forthcoming, but if you're a landowner, then it is. And you may have seen recently the um, article in The Guardian about Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia, who receives a vast amount of money for his 2,000-acre Glimpton estate in Oxfordshire, where he breeds racehorses. And th the thing that, that irritates George Monbiot more than anything else, and I'm with him on this, is the grouse moors, which uh, you know, are environmentally disastrous and but attract large amounts of cap payments. So we should have an upper limit on farm subsidy. Um, I believe we should continue to subsidise farmers, but I think we should have a, a top limit on the cap. So, in conclusion, rather than paying people for being fortunate enough to have a share of the common treasury, we should be taxing them for that privilege. And I also think that if we introduced a system of taxation like that, over time, land would cease to be profitable for many of the largest landowners, and then it therefore it would start to open up, not a market for land, but a system where land was more readily available for those who genuinely wanted to use it for their own subsistence or to provide or to grow and produce food for local markets. And I think the central principle of the farm support system, apart from not rewarding people simply for holding land, should be that we use that land for what's most important for our common future. And to me, that is carbon capture. So I think we should prioritise land use and farming systems that most efficiently absorb carbon dioxide. Thank you.
everybody. So, uh, as a Duncan, I don't know if I get the opportunity to introduce uh, another Duncan. So, uh, this is Duncan Bowie, a um, uh, lecturer at Westminster University and also a member of the very interesting Highbury group, which comprises lots of housing and uh, planning experts. Um, and he's going to talk yeah, more about this, the planning system and how we can better capture the value from that. Okay, thanks very much. It's great to be here and it's fantastic to actually see land getting back on the policy agenda in a way that hasn't been for decades. Um, I mean, in terms of, as well as my current role, I used to be in charge of the Housing Corporation Investment Programme in London for the government when it was funding social rented housing, which was a long time ago. And then I went to work for Ken Livingstone's Mayor of London, basically as lead planner on housing. So I kind of was in charge of the affordable housing policies in the London plan. Um, but also in terms of charge of setting up a system for negotiating with developers about extracting their surplus profit <laughs> for the purposes of affordable housing. Now, I'm not, I mean, you've, you've had earlier sessions on the history. I'm also a historian. I've just published a book on the history of the kind of land and housing and planning reform movements in the 19th century. But you need to distinguish between those who kind of argued for uh, move, removing restrictions on, on land uh, transactions and freeing it up those who actually have been argued for a uh, sort of plurality in land ownership, the old debates about pleasant, pleasant proprietorship, those that have argued for land taxation, uh, led by Henry George and but much earlier arguments, but also those who actually supported land nationalisation uh, in terms of the, the kind of more radical charters such as Bronte or O'Brien and debates later on in the working class movement. So there's a lot of history, but I think that's relevant because it sets the context for how we actually uh, deal with land in the current situation. Now, the, the kind of whole concept of betterment, the idea of public benefit from uh, land value appreciation, from private land ownership, has actually a long history. And in fact, there was considerable political consensus in the move towards the original 1909 Planning Act, which actually introduced a form of development land taxation into, into the planning regime, which was reinforced in, in the 1947 legislation. But the general presumption that the unearned increment, which Molly and others have, have described, was something that needed to be used for public purpose. And the public sector leadership, the municipalities of all political uh, control, actually argued for uh, effectively taxing the unearned increment because it was necessary to use that value uplift to fund the civic infrastructure. So you can find sort of the Association of Municipal Corporations, which was conservative controlled at that time, actually arguing for uh, some form of taxation of the unearned, unearned increment. Because without that, you wouldn't actually be able to build the civic infrastructure of municipal developments. Joseph Chamberlain, for example, was, was, a, was a great advocate of the, those changes in that period. But bringing us to much more sort of closer to the contemporary position, um, the kind of planning gain system as it sort of currently operates is primarily based on the 1990 Act and of course the, the clause uh, section 106, although there are previous provisions in, in legislation both in, in England and in Scotland. Uh, when I worked for the Mayor of London, what we actually did was we set up a system of appraisal of development proposals to assess whether the developer could actually contribute to broader public benefit. In other words, we set planning policies, the legendary 50% affordable housing target, and every developer scheme that came into City Hall, we assessed against that policy, and we got information from the developer as to what the economics of the scheme were, <coughs> confidential information in the early period. Um, and the argument was that bluntly, if the developer could actually uh, achieve the policy target without public subsidy, um, that that was required through the planning decision, but we also recognised that in some cases there was a case for public subsidy because this was also tied in to the public funding regime then run by the housing corporation. So the idea was that you never put public money into a private development if the surplus, the excess profit in the private development could actually fund the affordable housing. Uh, whether that was on or off-site was, was another debate. So the system actually worked quite well in the early years, and it was at the time when the government didn't actually use the term viability in planning. In fact, we had sort of various debates with central government at the time whether it was reasonable for us to do these kind of financial appraisals. But it was basically a form of value extraction, which actually worked quite well. Uh, the government then, of course, changed the rules post-recession, with all the developers saying, we're squeezed, we've you know, spent lots of money on buying this land. Uh, we can't actually deliver the affordable housing. So the government changed the rules very much in favour of the, the private developer and allowed the private developer the ability to renegotiate even through a formal appeal system. 
Um, what also, I mean, there are limitations of this system because the system basically related to the uplift uh, on value arising at the time of planning consent. And as Molly and others have said in other sessions, um, that you know, some of the, the value uplift comes from the planning decision, but also some of the value uplift comes from other developments in an area, what's been happening uh, in the neighbourhood, uh, but also from any zoning that the local authority may have made. I mean, if you zone a site for housing, that site is increasing in value even in advance of planning consent for a specific scheme. So the system has its limitations because it doesn't necessarily pick up value increment pre-planning consent and it certainly gen well, generally doesn't pick up uh, value appreciation post-planning consent. And you know, some of these major schemes take four or five years to build out, sometimes longer, and the value, you, know, you can be selling units for twice as much uh, you know, when you finish them as you assumed at the time you put the planning application in, uh, certainly in the case in London and the South East, but also parts of the country as well. We also, I mean, there was also a problem with who actually did the financial appraisals. I mean, I used to do them all myself at City Hall, so the developer used to come in with a financial appraisal and I used to check it and then argue with them and renegotiate. What's happened subsequently is both the Mayor of London and most local authorities contracted out to the same consultants who are acting on behalf of the developers in the first place. So you have serious issues of conflict of interest and lack of independence, and the consultant just basically says to the local authority that um, you know, this, we're happy that the developer can't actually do anything more and you basically need to accept that. And there have been a number of situations in which uh, even the decision makers, the councillors, have been refused access to the financial appraisal. There have been a series of court cases and freedom of information cases, so that's uh, eased off a little. So there is actually a need for a transparency, but there's also a need for independent expertise. The Mayor of London, the new Mayor of London, is just actually recruiting uh, independent financial appraisers. Um, but whether they you know, will be from consultancies and how independently they will act as, as yet to be tested. But basically, most planning staff are not trained up to do this kind of work. Um, the other question really is on long-term schemes, you really need to build in a mechanism for thresholding and reviews so that if values do increase above you know, the original assumption, that uh, more of that value comes back to the public sector. Um, or if, for example, more public funding becomes available, if we suddenly have a government that actually believes in funding social rented housing again, um, that you actually have flexibility, which means that if there's more public subsidy, you get more affordable housing out of it. Give, the, the, you know, the whole idea of cascades and reviews works both ways. So there are quite a lot of limitations uh, to the system. Um, there are, we therefore do need to consider alternatives. I mean, there's a lot of debate in London and elsewhere at the moment about basically a fixed rate and saying if a developer comes up with 35% affordable housing that you don't need to go through a financial appraisal system. I'm very nervous about that because it means in some cases which are highly profitable, we could have actually got a lot more affordable housing out of it. And the critical issue is not just is it some market housing, which the government now defines as affordable, anything up to £450,000, uh, capital value in London is now deemed as affordable by government in terms of national policy and anything up to 80% market rent is deemed as affordable. If that's the affordable housing we get, it's not really worth negotiating a planning gain deal on that basis. So we need to look at other mechanisms. Um, uh, my, I've always argued that uh, planning gain is useful as a one-off, but you actually need a longer term uh, binding of the public sector into value appreciation. So I've actually argued, and I argued this at the time of the Barker Review in 2004 when I still worked for the Mayor of London, that the uh, local authority should be able to use planning powers to take an equity stake in any private development. So you basically say that, you know, you get planning consent, but we just basically take a 50% share in any value uplift in perpetuity. Um, and, and that would bring a lot of the, the gain back to the public sector. Uh, I'm always in favour of local authorities keeping land rather than selling it. The public sector has been flogging off its land generally for the highest market receipt and often disregarding its own planning policies in order to maximise the receipt. The dilemma that public authorities are in to basically maintain their services, you effectively d don't uh, pro provide land for affordable housing. You, you basically say you can do 100% market housing, forget about the affordable housing, just give us the money and then we can keep some of the other services operating. That's problematic. I, I've always been a believer in local authorities should buy land rather than sell it. Uh, and also, and we should have done that in 2008 in the, in the crash. Um, but also, if we're selling land, uh, you should do it with very strict covenants. You can do all sorts of things under legal covenants on land disposals that you can't do under planning. 
So you can you know, control sale prices, you can control rents, you can control occupation. Uh, local authorities have those powers and should use them more widely. Uh, one thing I've been arguing for for many years, uh, and it got in the uh, we got it into the Lions report for the Labour Party, though not as strong as I wanted. That was the uh, Lions review on housing policy uh, a few years ago now, um, uh, which was the, the, the whole issue about uh, compulsory purchase at existing use value, which goes back to the fundamental principles of the 1947 Act. Uh, and as I said in an earlier session, there are provisions which look like they're going that way actually in the Neighbourhood Planning Bill in Parliament at the moment. Uh, which is staggering if the government is actually continuing to support that. But I think it's because the government realised that getting the land into the housing production chain as cheaply as possible is absolutely critical uh, if we are to get uh, more affordable housing. My concern about this is that it needs to be retained in public sector control or if sold on by the local authority to a, to a, to a private developer or housing association is, is for affordable housing only. But given in the London context, the land value is kind of 60, 70 percent of, of housing cost. Uh, that is absolutely critical, and that's why I'm stressing that planning can only do certain things. Actually, control over land is is really, uh, in many ways, much more important. Um, but you can also control the land value to a certain extent through very explicit zoning, saying that this site is only for affordable housing, and that's what we will compulsory acquire it at. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about land value tax, other than to say when you're promoting land value tax, you've got to be very clear what you're promoting it for and what the likely impact is. And I think part of the historic debates is that there hasn't been adequate distinction between the idea of taxing all land, taxing development land, or taxing value appreciation, either in relation to land or the property on it. And my own position is that we need to be promoting a whole range of reforms of land and property tax, including not just revaluating revaluing council tax, but relating uh, council tax to levels of occupation, so uh, people are taxed more for under-occupying and incentive to downsize. Uh, I've also been arguing for replacement of stamp duty by capital gains tax on all property. The question is whether you tax that on an annual appreciation basis or on disposal. It has different impacts on, on transactions and incentivising downsizing. Um, there are cases for, uh, as I say, not so much taxing development land, but actually bringing development land under public control, which is basically what, what CPOs would achieve. Um, so we need a series of measures. I think those, as I say, a lot of people who argue for land value tax in the Henry Georgiite sense, going back to 120, 130 years ago, uh, need to be aware of the very different context and the very different purposes and impacts of different tax reforms. But we've got to basically have planning policy reform, housing policy reform, housing investment, property and land tax reform, uh, and to, to a certain extent, positive reforms to, have, to, to the benefit system all as a, as, as a package. Um, and if I can give a plug, this is all in a book called Radical Solutions to the Housing Crisis, being published by Policy Press in January. So people who were saying earlier is what's the, the manifesto and what's the agenda. Most of what people have been, been arguing for um, is, is in there. And it's a matter of convincing uh, people to uh, a, a political level. I mean, I work mainly in the Labour Party, but I work with a range of political parties basically convincing them of the economic arguments as well as the housing policy arguments for this uh, radical agenda, which was understood much better 120 years ago than it is now. Could you just slowly restate that book title? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I mean, it's called Radical Solutions to the uh, Housing Supply Crisis, and it's published by Policy Press in January. It's actually written, so they just have to publish it. Um, and you can buy it now, pre-order for seven ninety nine. I think it's nine ninety nine <laughs> if you wait to January. That's a good plug. I'll tell yeah. my publisher that. If you want to read the history stuff, um, I did write a book called The Radical and Socialist Tradition in British Planning, which I'm trying to get out in paperback. It was only published earlier in the year, but it's basically a history of all those land and housing uh, uh, and, and planning uh, campaigns, mainly in the 19th century. Unfortunately, that will cost you 95 quid at the moment. So <laughs> do write to Routledge and say get the paperback out quickly.
Um, I also did a book on London a, a few years ago um, and how planning gain worked in London, but that was published in 2010 and the world has moved rather backwards since then, so that's, that's a little bit out of date. So after all those plugs, well I'm saying all the information's there. Um, as Duncan mentioned earlier, I've also been for, for the last eight years convening this group called the Hybrid Group of Housing Delivery. It has a website, it's got policy papers by all sorts of people on it, including several people who've been here over the yep. weekend. Yep. Um, so that's, that's all in the public arena and as some of the things we've been lobbying through for, for the last eight years, actually, in terms of... Uh, thank you so much, uh, both of you. So I'm just going to uh, talk very, very quickly about... So a couple of years ago, I was uh, from, the, I'm from the New Economics Foundation asked to kind of look into the idea of uh, land and taxation. And as I looked into it, I felt that a lot of the taxation solutions, and there are a myriad of solutions offering a variety of different benefits, a variety of different outcomes, uh, a lot of them very valid, um, we're all tackling a kind of symptom of the problem. And I think we, unheard, we heard it you know, mentioned a few times, you know, Molly mentioned it a few times, but I've heard it mentioned across a lot of the sessions, that the fundamental problem of land is, uh, or as, as, as I see it, is, is that it's owned. Uh, and we then have to, if you, once you accept this private ownership, you then have to put in place all of these other uh, policies, tax arrangements, uh, in order to then redistribute the inequity of having that initial factor of ownership. Um, so I then started to explore much more idea about whether there was a kind of uh, vision of uh, an ownership that wasn't just transferring it all to the state. Uh, the state. Uh, although historically has maybe been okay in the recent years has had not had a great track record in managing the public land uh, for the for our own good um, and about whether there was something we could do about reinvigorating a true commons not a uh, necessarily an old commons where the land was privately owned but we had kind of use rights over it but a true commons where we did really all own it collectively uh, and so this has kind of generated into the conversation that Beth and I and others have been having and Duncan you know, also kindly participated in as well, in trying to talk through about how can we start to have that move happen. Now I won't go into a lot of the detail because Beth very kindly probably did a better job than me <coughs> at explaining the, kind of the, the, the overarching policy this morning on the panel. So, um, but for those who weren't there, it's the idea of at the point of sale uh, transferring the land into kind of a, a citizen's land trust uh, with then the obligation to then pay to, to stay on the land. Now where Beth presented a kind of voluntary model and that already has a lot, a lot of benefits, um, what I have trying to explore, and I know that there are serious concerns about this, and as Beth also mentioned, it's really not a fully fledged proposal yet. Uh, you know, I really like the idea of it being mandatory. So that at the point of sale, you would not be able to uh, continue to own the land. It would mandatorily transfer into the, this, this kind of citizen's land trust. Um, and once you make it mandatory, and I, and I fully understand that there are huge obstacles in way of, uh, in a sense, outlawing private ownership of land overnight. Uh, and I don't underestimate that. Um, I mean, I was heartened a little bit, uh, you know, just before this, I came from running the, the common strategy session upstairs, where uh, at a finger in the air, I would say about 90% of people supported the long-term vision of no private property and common land. Now, a slightly self-selecting bunch of people, <laughs> I probably admit, but it was at least heartening that in a group like this, that there is this, you know, this understanding and agreement. But, you know, strong questions remain about how you would make such a system work uh, and indeed as Beth um, kind of opened it up this morning uh, anybody that wants to participate you know Julian sitting there has been a huge inspiration for the ideas as well um, so you know how do we fund this and there are a number of different ways that we're thinking about from borrowing and I heard Beth talk about some of them afterwards QE I also my other area of work is in alternative currencies I also kind of fancy the idea of a land credit being issued as a compensation uh, the idea of it being mandatory and voluntary and what are the different benefits that we could reap from both of them as well as the different obstacles. Uh, what protections do we need to put in place to make sure that we don't see the same kind of social gentrification, uh, social um, <coughs> cleansing that we see from current housing and taxation policies. And then the scale, should it be something that's national, regional, 
or local. So still a lot of questions out there, but I just want to flag up that you know addressing this fundamental of ownership <coughs> is another viable way of, of, of kind of capturing this value for communities. And it, it offers a kind of different ideological question, which is, you know, can we outlaw uh, ownership and how do we build a movement around that? How do we popularize that? Given the struggles there's been just to tax it, uh, either at the land value end or even just revaluating council tax, we haven't been able to do that. So how do we, you know, it's a big question about how we move towards more radical reforms. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna leave it there because really what I wanted was to get some questions and comments from the audience. Uh, I know we've only got about 20 minutes, but, um, but yeah, so maybe does anybody have any questions, comments? Please. So, question to you, based on this idea of shared land ownership, I guess a market is a way of distributing who has access to something. How would the decisions about distribution and land use be made if the land ownership was in some kind of common uh, yeah, so I mean, those are, those are absolutely valid questions and probably at a level of detail that we haven't got to. But I mean, the ideas would basically be the same. So if you, if you owned a house, you would have this obligation to pay what we're calling a land use charge. Uh, and that would then get you the right to occupy that bit of land provided you continue to meet that, uh, that charge. But it, it wouldn't be able to happen in isolation. You'd have to change the way that communities plan their local areas. Uh, and, and the idea also, mirroring a bit what Molly said about land value tax, it should also bring a lot more land into being available because there'd be now a cost associated with just holding onto the land, which would be uneconomical in a lot of cases. And so a lot of extra land would become more available and so there'd be less pressure on the land. We'd be returning much more to housing, uh, to, to, to land being either to, to live in or to farm or to, to use. We wouldn't be hoarding it and uh, you know and uh, uh, exploiting it and so hopefully all of those transitions mean that they were less stressed more people could actually get what they wanted out of the land I don't know if, if I can yes. just come in I mean a lot of people who live in a flat have the leasehold over the flat and not the freehold right but effectively it doesn't make any difference if you've got a thousand year leasehold or even a hundred year leasehold unless you're you know really going to live a long time then it isn't an issue for you and I think one of the things we need to think about in connection with what Duncan was outlining is the idea of inheriting land, mm -hmm. you know, because even the classical economists often thought that you shouldn't be able to inherit wealth from a previous generation. I mean, the wealthy, ex including Trump, sadly, um, excuse their wealth or explain their wealth on the basis of how hard they've worked. Well, that doesn't apply to inherited wealth, does it? So I think, you know, inheriting land is something where we could really question how much of the land should then pass into <coughs> common ownership, because that's mm -hmm. how inequity through generations and, and concentration of power and wealth happens. And in terms of um, <coughs> managing the, the, the common land ownership, this is where Eleanor Ostrom won her Nobel Prize for work on that. And social, I mean, it isn't the case that all um, economic assets are controlled through a market system. We have all sorts of different social mechanisms and that would be my suggestion that we use something a little bit more like that. Great, thank you. Yep. How do you maintain the diversity in the middle of the city like London where sure the land value is actually determined that the progression of the middle of the and we get that towards the outside? Okay, I'm going to take a couple of questions now, so we have a bit of diversity one. Yep, yeah. uh, sorry, do I see any other hands? I saw some hands come up here. Some, if you can remember long ago, in our Wilson's time, bring in some tax on the development land that was dropped. I was wondering why it was dropped. There was a <coughs> land tax, wasn't there, at some point many years ago? There was. We'll just get one more question, I'll get you to a whole history of that, so that's tax and development tax. Yes. Yeah, just interested how this land tax would work in terms of a piece of land <coughs> doing what itself wants to do. In other words, environmental aspect. Mm -hmm. And how that tax would come into that. <coughs> yeah. Do you want to talk about history? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, the, there are effectively three attempts at uh, bringing all development land into public ownership. Uh, the, the 1947 arrangements by which, which there was basically a public agency that acquired land, but that was um, closed down by the Tory government in 51 or 52. There was the uh, uh, development land tax arrangements in the 1960s under the Wilson government, which um, was based effectively on 100% of value, and again that was repealed by the successive Conservative government. 
and then in the late 19, the mid 1970s, um, there was the community land tax. Um, again, uh, the idea of bringing all development land in, into public sector ownership. I mean, my own view is that the kind of CPO provisions, uh, compulsory purchase provisions, going back to the basic principles of the 47 Act, are the best way of controlling that, because it would mean that the local authority had the power to acquire land from a developer. And what's interesting, that would be a, 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 a power to acquire any land suitable for development for any purpose, both from a landowner or from a developer, irrespective of whether planning consent had been granted, uh, which would give the local authority the option of either taking it over directly or taking it over and then transferring it over under a covenant arrangement to uh, developers or, or housing associations or whoever would meet the criteria set. I mean, the, the other basic principle of the 47 Act was that local authority in determining um, the use of land would control land value that way. That the practice of the market has actually been uh, that uh, effectively developers will acquire the land uh, at hope value and then use that acquisition cost to negotiate their way out of planning policy compliance, which is why we actually introduced the planning gain assessment system in the London context in, 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 in the early 2000s. Um, uh, that system has, has just been ineffective um, because effectively the government then said, and planning inspectors in many cases have said, that the developer is reasonable in paying an enhanced acquisition cost and then saying they can't deliver the policy. So the idea of planning as controlling land value hasn't worked in practice, which is why the reserve powers for the local authority to do it through compulsory purchase at what we call existing use value would actually support that system. But we still need a plan-led system. I mean, planning should be based on the local authority assessing what's needed in an area and then only agreeing planning consents for what is of public benefit in terms of the assessment of need. And the planning system doesn't work anything like that at the moment. It's just local authorities responding to developer proposals um, and trying to squeeze some kind of a deal out of it, but one that isn't entirely satisfactory or even remotely satisfactory. So planning is effectively responding to market demand, which is all about investment and value appreciation. It's nothing to do with the needs of the community, and we need to return planning to what was the basic principles of the 1909 Act, never mind the 1947 legislation, which is that planning should be for public benefit and public needs. It's as simple as that. Yes. <laughs> Molly, do you want to come in? It's making me realise why Trump became president of the US. No, it's making me realise why people are getting so fed up with politicians actually listening to you when you think that actually over the past hundred years we've gone backwards on this issue yeah. and it's the result of lobbying by developer interests effectively and no doubt, interests. no doubt, yeah, and, and those same interests no doubt funding political parties. So, you know, it's... It's in a way this is what we need to change because it's it's part it's undermining our whole democratic system now. This lack of trust that public systems, this is a public planning system, that they're actually not working for us anymore. Um, I I don't really I hadn't really thought through your question, but I mean I'm I think that really the reason people live in certain zones in London is more to do with the rents that they're paying than the, than the tax they would be paying, actually. I mean, council tax would be a much smaller <coughs> proportion of your income to be spent than rents. So I think the solution to your question is more about rent controls than it is about um, changing the way council tax works. Um, I mean, with land value tax, usually the person that's considered to lose out is the the widow who lives in a, or widower who lives in a house where they brought up their children and doesn't want to move and now can't afford the tax on that large property, which you were calling under, under habitation or yeah, under occupation. Under occupation, exactly. So um, you know, that's the incentive for people to, to downsize that, that Duncan was talking about. I think it's those people that tend to lose out from a social point of view rather than it resulting in um, loss of diversity. And who asked the question about? Um, changing land use and making more land available for not doing anything with, which I think is an excellent idea. Um, I think one of the things that might come about from the, farms, the new farm support system is that forms of agriculture that are very economically unviable may no longer be able to be supported, and so there may be an option for parts of our land to return to natural states or semi-managed states, or there's a bit of a debate about exactly what rewilding means. but. I think you know this is one of the things that may well happen, and again has met with some favourable responses um, at government level. I think rewilding Britain are calling for four percent of our land to return to um, naturally managed state or 
barely managed state, shall we say. Um, and I think, you know, that's an opportunity, again, where land tax could be used, if, if, you know, because you could zero rate um, rewilded areas. You could also zero rate organically farmed areas, or you could zero rate areas under forestry if that was providing carbon capture. So, I mean, I, t I totally agree with Duncan that the sort of real land value tax aficionados argue for the sort of Henry George single tax um, way of looking at this, but I think actually land taxes could be used in a flexible way to encourage and incentivize all sorts of um, ways of using the land that we as a society thought were beneficial. Can I come back yeah. on one point which yeah. is responding partly to that question, which is about the relationship between planning gain, infrastructure and house prices, and it's a really important point. We often talk about how we actually use planning gain from value increment to fund infrastructure, to fund transport infrastructure, to fund affordable housing. And we're now using planning gain as a substitute for public funding. So you know, all affordable housing, all schools, all health facilities are now basically going to be funded, so the government thinks, from planning gain from private development because the public funding has been removed. So when we have planning gain as a supplement to public funding, it's effectively now a substitute for public funding. That, of course, puts house prices up. The more also you put money into an infrastructure, in terms of transport infrastructure, good schools, good health facilities, good parks, um, the more that actually increases the value of properties in that area. So we have the difficulty of the more public investment we put, even if it's public investment funded through planning gain, the more we increase house prices and the more we make areas less affordable. So we've got a situation where some of the suburban areas, which have been relatively low value, and you can take Erith or Dagenham as examples, the two cheapest places in London, uh, um, are now becoming more expensive because of the public transport infrastructure we're putting in, you know, Crossrail, High Speed One, and the rest of it, are actually going to lead to massive house price inflation. And if you, you look at house price inflation, it's the suburban areas which are beginning to catch up. Uh, so we're actually making, through this infrastructure investment, because we're not managing the property market and we're not controlling affordability, we're actually making the affordability situation far worse. Um, so, you know, we need to actually have the full package so we actually can control the housing market and ensure that public investment doesn't just lead to house price inflation, which is the current position. So, you know, taking one part of the package doesn't actually solve the problem. We need the public transport infrastructure, but we need to both obviously subsidise transport costs for low-income households in the suburbs, but you also need to keep their housing affordable as well. And so long as the property market is run by private investment and asset appreciation, funding public infrastructure actually has negative consequences. Very interesting. Thank you, David. <laughs> yes. <coughs> so behind you, Julian, first, and then after you, Julian. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hey. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was wondering, so people, uh, in Frome, which the local community have taken over, they've decided to use the council's general power of competence to start developing and do all kinds of really interesting things. Um, and they've got money, I think, through the public loans board or some, like, public money that's available. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. um, so I was, I, I know there's not much, there's hardly any political will in London at the moment to do things like citizens' land trusts um, and to develop housing in that kind of way so you keep the value in the citizens' land trusts. Um, but I was wondering, is that because there's a lack of uh, political will or, or is it because the framework won't support it at the moment? Um, I mean, if you had a different bunch of councillors and said, this is a really great idea, could they do it? Okay, great question. <coughs> Julian? I'm just really interested in the extent to which we are or are not making links with international moves towards land value capture. Um, and the reason I ask that is because I was hearing uh, about some of the large stream of discussion at Habitat 3, which was the conference uh, held in Quito last month, um, at which uh, the issue about different methods of land value capture was discussed and there's some tremendous stuff in some of their preparatory papers and I just wonder to what extent we're gaining strength from that international movement but also contributing to it. Uh, is the um, is land value assessed when land is allocated for a certain use or when planning permission is given for a certain use? Do you want to take that one quickly, Duncan? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both of those come back. Um, 
planning determination shouldn't have regard to land value. I mean, that's the, how planning law works, but obviously planning uh, allocations and planning consents have a dramatic impact on land value. Certainly a local authority in setting its plan and setting its targets is required to do what's called an overall viability assessment of its overall plan uh, to ensure that it's not actually putting burdens, as the government put it, on developers. So in setting their targets, their uh, com community infrastructure levy, they're supposed to do an overall assessment of the viability for the developer. They are not necessarily required to do an assessment on the affordability of those developers to residents, which in my view is part of the equation. Um, so, I mean, technically uh, planning isn't supposed to impact on value, but it does, uh, and that's really important. Um, international experience, I, I think we need to use international experience a lot more. I mean, I'm aware of those, the, the discussions at Habitat 3. Um, I don't know whether you know the Lincoln Institute of Land Value, which has run out of New York. Sorry, I've run out of um, Pennsylvania, sorry, not New York, um, which publishes some amazing documentation on land value capture, um, not p to pure right Georgia position necessarily, though there's a history there. And I did interestingly have a very useful conversation with the chief executive of the Lincoln Institute uh, last week when we were both at a conference in <laughs> Beijing, just as I didn't make keto, but I'm in Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still recovering. Um, uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of experience there, but we're way behind. I mean, to a certain extent, we invented land value capture in, in you know, the 1890s and then the 1909 Act and the 1910 Budget, which we haven't talked about, which introduced taxation of all land, the, the, the controversial um, Lloyd George Budget. Um, and, and other countries, especially certain states in America, through things like community infrastructure, mm -hmm. so community, um, forms of different, different forms of taxation. Um, are actually much more effective and they actually have many states or cities have a zoning policy which sets the planning parameters and has a financial deal very much much greater power uh, than, than we have here and as I say these things we invented and then forgot about um, I mean in other countries they effectively have state control over land I mean in China they just own everything and can turf everybody out so I mean that's how they have such a, a major scale of development and Singapore effectively operates a state controlled capitalist system there are different countries that do things different ways community um, uh, community land trusts I'm going to be very unpopular in what I'm going to say community land trusts only work if somebody gives you the land um, that's why they haven't taken off in mainly urban areas because uh, why should councils give land to one group, whether it's a community group, whether it's a co-ownership scheme, whether it's a rental scheme. Some of the projects are great pilots. Some of them are trying to hold affordability down, such as the St. Clement scheme in Tower Hamlets, which is the only substantive scheme that's got off the ground in London so far. But if you're a local authority, you know, you can develop directly if you've got the political will. Um, some people talk about CLTs because it exempts you from the right to buy, but I mean, you know, we repeal the right to buy. That's what a government <laughs> should do. So local authorities can develop directly. I mean, the garden city movement only worked on the basis of philanthropy, somebody giving them land, and then they could collectivise and trustifies the increase in land value. My own view is that should be done through a publicly accountable local government structure. Now, um, you can use CLTs in certain circumstances, but unless you've got somebody to give you the land, uh, other than the local authority, it's going to be very marginal. And we spend far too much time talking about marginal initiatives and not about the fundamentals. And that's what I'm be really upset people. <laughs> Carry on with the pilot initiatives, but we've got to challenge the fundamentals. Great, thanks, Duncan. Well, I'm, I'm happy to pol be political and change the law, but since the Greens only have one MP due to our outrageous electoral system, <laughs> I also appreciate the fact that in Stroud we get on and do things within a really crap political structure, and we do have some very good um, yeah. community land trusts for farmland and for woodland around Stroud. We do have a hashtag, NFX normal for Stroud, but it could be normal for anywhere, um, which takes me to Froome, actually. Um, so I think the council are doing some amazing things in Froome, but they are a town council, aren't they? So they're not a district council. So they're effectively at parish level. And that means that when they gather a precept, they're not limited in the amount of precept they can take. And an interesting thing that seems to be coming now, a precept is a tax, a local tax. So the government has capped the amount that your district council or county council can tax you but they have not capped um, the local tax that parish councils can take. 
And for this reason in Swindon now, which is half parished, so half of it is parish councils, they are now trying to parish the whole area so that they can push responsibility for services that the borough council can no longer afford to pay for down to the precepting authority, which can charge a higher tax. That was, sorry, that was a bit of an aside, but I think that's how it's being done in Froome, because they, they have, as you say, you know, if, you, if nobody's told you you can't do it, you can do it, and that's always a good principle in common law anyway. Um, but it, you need the money to do these things, and in, if you're a parish council, you can just increase the amount that you charge. So I think that's how they're doing that. But they're doing great stuff with those powers, and a lot of other people could indeed be doing that at that same level. Um, and about the international angle, I, I think it's a very good idea, but I think we should also try and uh, adopt that idea of land reform that happens in lots of other countries, but it never happens in these sort of sophisticated Western countries where we live, but perhaps it should. Great, I know we're already over. Did you want to say something, Beth? Uh, I, I was quite interested in, in, in uh, expanding, Duncan, on the point that you made about it being very different whether you capture, whether you tax changes in value of land on an annual basis yeah. or on disposal. Because yeah. that was the idea of, of a capital gains tax on sale of your property for your primary residence was raised by a couple of people this morning and yeah. it seems problematic to me um, or highly unpopular to do it that way. And I, well, I'm probably unpopular to do it either way, but um, I just wondered whether you could. Expand a bit on yes, I mean, I mean, the original George I proposition was an annual land tax, and uh, it, it was as a replacement for all other taxes, including income taxes and uh, consumer taxes. That was known as the single tax, and I think that's problematic. I mean, the idea of abolishing all income tax and consumer taxes and having a tax on on, on assets, and it, it, in a sense, it would have to be land and property rather than just land. Um, the the difficulty of, of uh, I mean. T you can t what, one option which I didn't mention is reintroducing Schedule A income tax, which we used to operate, which um, a few people in the room will remember, which was effectively a, a, a tax on the imputed rental value of home ownership. So you were taxed for being a homeowner, equivalent to to, to the rent. Uh, Who abolished that? Uh, the well, it was abolished by the Conservative government in the whenever they came in 1970. Heath. It was Heath, yeah, 1970-71 was abolished. Um, didn't run for very long, it was introduced in, in the 60s. Um, so there, there are other ways you can do it. I mean, the difficulty about a tax on capital gain is that it acts as a disincentive to people who are under-occupying to downsize. Um, the advantage of a tax on capital gain is that, it, you know, especially if it's capital gain on death, um, is that it actually hits the next generation. Now, you can argue that the next generation is squeezed, but if you talk about trying to abolish inheritance, which is actually where John Stuart Mill started in the land tenure reform movement in the 1860s, um, that you know this issue that inheritance is the greatest source of wealth and equity across generations is really quite an important issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, it would basically be those to inherit um, who, who would actually be most disadvantaged um, by that. But I mean, if you say you're going to abolish stamp duty, which is a tax on purchase, and all it does is inflate house prices anyway, it doesn't help marginal homeowners at all, and replace it by an attacks on capital gain, which is when people realise the assets or their children do on death, um, you know, it actually doesn't uh, have a negative impact on access to home ownership, or that it does have a negative impact on access to home ownership for those who might be inheriting their parents' wealth, who at the moment are basically the only people who can die. And as Gavin Barwell says, because of how long we live, it's the grandchildren who will benefit, not the children. Um, but it that's doesn't why it penalise you, you the generation. If, you, if you move house regularly, yes. well, what, that penalises you. Well, if you're, what you would need is uh, exemptions and credit arrangements for those who are moving into larger homes because their families are grown. You wouldn't want to disadvantage them. Uh, you would need to take into account kind of regional variations, so you'd need quite a sophisticated approach. But I think the starting point is right, that you actually tax people from their capital gain rather than you tax people when they're trying to raise the mortgage to buy. Um, because in that sense, you don't actually disadvantage those trying to access the market as first-time buyers. What you do is dis dis disadvantage those who are actually only able to purchase through inheritance, which is, of course, inequitous between generations, um, which is the fundamental problem that we actually started with. 
Um, so we need, we, I mean, we need to model a number of options, and very few, you know, this work is not being done, so you need to model the options, look at the impacts, argue the economic case, and there's a basic issue of fairness now, and because so many households realise they can't afford to buy, the majority now is actually in favour of these kind of changes. We just need to present them. Um, just like the issue of taxing people for under-occupying. I nearly got it in the Liberal Manifesto about 10 or 15 years ago when Sarah Tether was a shadow Liberal Minister who was quite keen on it. But of course, uh, you know, it was regarded as not very popular with a certain amount of voters. It's just why, you know, the Labour Party opposed the mansion tax in, in London because, you know, Labour voters were sitting in properties worth two million.